Hello. Welcome to the fourth part of a special series that I'm having with Asmarom. I'm speaking with him uh, with regard to the ongoing situation in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, where a war has devastated the civilian population and has since spread to other parts of the country and have devastated millions of people, internally displaced citizens of the country, starvation, and other crimes associated with military actions have brutalized uh, the war scene. And as a result, I felt it necessary to speak with Asmaram to discuss these issues. You know, we've been talking for quite some time now about the impact that this war has had on the civilian population. But in recent weeks, we've seen that the Ethiopian government is trying to take the next step in terms of reconciliation or what they deem to be that uh, momentous uh, launch into uh, moving on from the past, as Prime Minister Abiy said himself, he wants to enter into the so-called national dialogue with folks from all over the country. But it seems like people are actively disinterested. Uh, for instance, the FANO, which are a controversial group in the Amhara region, are having some mixed uh, reactions from uh, high-level officials in the region, including Eskinder Nega and others who are more supportive of that line and others who feel that Fano misrepresents the Amhara body politic. Uh, from your perspective, Asmaram, who do you think really represents the interest of Tigray and how do you think we can recognize the uh, authenticity of a ruling party in that region? Or is that even the way we should be thinking about it? When you have, uh, you know, a fundamentally authoritarian country like Ethiopia, it's very hard for us to sort of uh, pinpoint exactly who has a legitimacy. Um, as you know, the TPLF it won about 98% of the vote in Tigray's regional election before the war, September 2020, and that arguably led to the war occurring, especially at the rate that it did. Um, does that mean necessarily that 98% of the Tigrayan people are diehard supporters of the TPLF? No. A lot that went into that vote was the experience that the TPLF had in, in politics and in administration and their ability to sort of weather the storm in what was uh, most certainly a chaotic period. Um, as far as uh, the election that happened uh, nationally in June of 2021, uh, that saw the Prosperity Party win an overwhelming majority of the seats, about 94%. Many of the uh, political opposition was incarcerated, including who you just mentioned, Eskinder Nega. Um, however, I think we need to be honest and just admit that Abiy Ahmed tends to have, uh, has, a, has pretty significant and considerable support, especially amongst evangelicals, especially in the wider south and center of the country, uh, throughout parts of Oromia and uh, places that are formerly uh, called the Southern People's Region. And the TPLF also has a considerable amount of support in Tigray. And uh, we need to move past this sort of um, intransigence and insist that there's one actor that is inherently um, unable to sit for a dialogue. You know, I think uh, placing cadres of certain groups just to just for the sake of diversity will actually make the situation worse. So uh, for a, a dialogue to go forward, I think the TPLF has to be a part of it. They are the closest thing to a, a uh, popular group in Tigray than we have. And there's no denying it. Does that mean that every Tigrayan who uh, lives in the region and voted for them is necessarily uh, approves of all of their history and the decisions being made? No, but that is the best that we have in the context that we are in right now. Well, some people see that as inflammatory, uh, perhaps in two aspects. Firstly, among Tigrayans, 
there are other opposition parties in Tigray who want to have a voice within the region and also nationally. But there's also, in, for Eritreans, the fear that if the TPLF uh, is given a seat at the negotiating table, that it would undermine the so-called peace process. Um, how do you feel about that? What do you think we should do in order to uh, understand Ethiopia's path to recovery, if there is still a chance for that to occur? Uh, I think we all have to recognize the faults and concerns of the other parties. Um, I think people need to realize the devastating humanitarian crisis that is going on within Tigray right now and how that is directly linked to the labeling of the TPLF as a terrorist organization. That has been the justification for services to be cut, for um, aid to be blocked and obstructed, that this is a terrorist group and therefore the region that they inhabit needs to be treated as sort of like a Gaza in that context. So I think recognizing the grievances that people have against the parties that are involved in this conflict and having an honest self-reflection on how the conflict has really morphed itself into a more ethnic conflict than, than anything needs to be acknowledged. I mean, this is ultimately as much as is a fight between political parties, but this is also a fight between nations, unfortunately. And um, many Tigrayans have, uh, have sidelined their criticisms and their critiques and their um, issues that they had with the TPLF and all and all and decided that this is a conflict that threatens the existence of themselves as a nation. And I think it's this existential sort of element about this conflict is what makes it so vicious, so violent, and so enduring too. You know, if if everyone is convinced that this is a fight to the finish, a fight for the survival of your people, it'll be very hard to have middle ground because nobody wants to negotiate or compromise on their existence or on their survival. That's something that's a very basic uh, baseline that uh, most people are not willing to uh, or probably shouldn't even attempt to, uh, to compromise. So I think uh, understanding the, the, the implications of making this conflict a people's war rather than a war between political entities and understanding the toxic nature that that has, I think that needs to be realized before anyone goes into the table. But um, I believe in our last talk uh, that we did uh, mention sort of the peace overtures um, have you noticed anything on your end that signals that maybe there's some sort of uh, peace on the way, or do you think this is a sort of a deliberate attempt to placate the concerns of the international community? Well, I think what you said about the conflict in Tigray being a people's war is absolutely accurate. It's really hard to distinguish now who are civilians and who are combatants. Um, you may remember that during the war against the Derg, uh, there were many peasant campaigns uh, in Amharic. It was the Wedizamach, uh, where people who were unskilled, uh, mainly farmers, uh, were trained by uh, military uh, personnel in order to fight against the rebellion groups that had formed. And they were ineffective in part because they just had no prior experience to defending territory. And in doing so, their suffering passed on to others who then took up the uh, call to arms and it amassed so many civilians to eventually sacrifice their lives in such a, a brutal war, especially in the latter half of uh, the 1980s um, after the height of the Ethiopian famine. In terms of what you asked me about the Eritrean perspective on the national dialogue and whether this is a genuine uh, transition to peace, I think I've made it very clear in my personal outlook, but also just in general, as long as Isaiah Saforki is in power, I don't think Eritrea will ever see peace. Um, that's, uh, that's a non-starter for many people uh, who are still somehow uh, 
they view him in an admirable light, uh, mainly because he hasn't done much in the public uh, view to question his supporters. You know, he hasn't really done much to shift one way or the other. He's very consistent in his methodology. He has the same message today as he did 20 years ago, which is to get rid of the TPLF. And he's, to his supporters' eyes, followed on that, on that goal. Unfortunately for him, in the process, he sacrificed so many youth of a new generation who probably don't necessarily understand the full impact of this war. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the current generation who's fighting the war in Tigray have been in part brutalized and victimized uh, by being fed so much hatred and propaganda against Tigrayans that they genuinely believe some of the lies that have been pushed on Eritrean news outlets that support the regime. I think that's very uh, tragic because I know you as a Tigrayan are very pleasant to speak with and many that I've spoken to are you know, just normal people. But unfortunately, the conversations that people have had have become so ostracized and so polarized that there really isn't a way to see eye to eye, even if we come from different backgrounds. And it becomes almost irreconcilable. So I would say the ideology that he has brought upon, Isaiah, I'm, I'm referring to, he needs to leave. And he has to uh, step down. I don't know if he will do so. I, I don't think he has any intentions on retiring. But I think the civilian population in Eritrea has the responsibility to uh, pressure the army or to pressure any other institution that has the capability to force him to leave because they have the right, you know. Eritreans in diaspora are taxed without representation. How can the government expect us to recognize their authenticity if we're not even being represented legitimately? So that's really where we need to uh, get over this pass is, can we get to the point where we have a government that actually represents the interests of us? They don't, in my opinion, they don't represent Eritrea. The PFDJ does not represent Eritrea in any way. They only represent their personal interests. I think it's really important for people to recognize that we have never had any elections. We didn't approve to send troops into Jagrai. I'm sure there are some Eritreans in Eritrea who don't even know the extent to which the war has devastated Tigray. And I don't say that uh, as a way to excuse what, you know, what they know or what they don't know. I'm genuinely serious in that the regime is very careful about how they curtail information. You may remember that during the missile launch that the TPLF did against Asmara, that day, the news report was about chickens on the farm being hatched. And months later, the Eritrean government supporters are demanding other people to recognize that as the start of Eritrea's involvement in the war when they denied it themselves. So if you're not dealing with a government that will accept the basic tenets of reality, then how do you even have a, a legitimate conversation with them? I just don't think it's ever possible to do so. And unfortunately, I don't really see any alternative to really oppose that. In Tigray, it's a different issue because even though the TPLF has an overwhelming majority in the region, there are the facilities that will allow other parties to have a say, especially coming from what I would you know, consider the right uh, of the TPLF, which includes, but is not limited to, Salsai Wayane, uh, Baito, um, the third Wayane, essentially. Um, and TIP, the Tigray Independence Party. They're really pushing the TPLF to call for Tigray's independence. Whether or not that actually materializes is a separate issue. But the point is, there are separate entities in Tigray that are actually holding them accountable on the interests that Tigrayans feel at this point. Maybe not now, but um, 
regardless of whether it was now or at the beginning of the conflict, there are ways in which Tigray civilians can actually express those views. There's nothing like that in Eritrea. There's no alternative to the PFTJ in that regard. So until you have that level of freedom, it's just not possible. You mentioned that the elections in Tigray, uh, the last or the most recent ones, uh, were overwhelming in their you know, they skewed towards the Tigray rule. Uh, I don't know if those are really accurate or legitimate, but they happened. They're elections. Ethiopia had elections in 2005, as you mentioned to me previously, and in 2015, that were very controversial outcomes. Nevertheless, I think as long as they're able to prove to the international community that they can have some semblance of democracy and they can they can formalize their institutions so that people will respect them, they'll continue to get respect. But there's nothing like that in Eritrea. And I don't say this, Will, I don't say this because I, I want to say it. I say it because I'm very upset. There's never been an election in Eritrea's history. The parliament of Eritrea hasn't met since 2002. Where are the voices of Eritreans being represented in Eritrea? They're not there. And I would like to see Eritrea and Tigray reconcile on the border, but it has to happen at the local level. And it has to happen between people who understand the nuances of the border. And until that can occur, I'm not sure if there's ever really going to be a legitimate peace process that can occur. Remember back in 2018, the Tigrayan region was not even involved in the peace process between Abiy Ahmed and Isaiah Saforki. Debrezio and Gebru Mikhail was not really able to elicit any communication between Asmara or Addis Ababa. He was stuck in Mekele. Why was Isaiah visiting Gondar? Why wasn't he visiting Mekele? Amhara does not border Eritrea. First, he should go to Mekele and Semara. Then he should be going to Addis Ababa. Why is he going to the Amhara region? Why is he visiting Abiy Ahmed uh, so much more often than he did with, than with Meles or with Haile Mariam Dasalin? Why did he allow Abiy Ahmed to go to Sawa? I've never seen anyone go to Sawa except for Abiy. Maybe someone can correct me, but I'm not sure if any world leader has gone to Sawa besides Abiy. So I, I mention all these things because the Eritrean government is a very clandestine in their methods and how they operate the country. And until we have some sort of accountability and transparency, I don't think really peace is ever going to be on the agenda for the Eritrean government. And notice the distinction, the Eritrean government. I'm sure the Eritrean people would like to see peace. And I include myself in this. I do not hold anything, uh, I don't hold anything against Tigrayans. You know, I've seen some insults uh, against Eritrea independence, and I've seen some things that are really hurtful, but also realize this is a very vulnerable time for everyone. So it takes a lot of endurance to take it on the chin and to realize that these people are also hurting and also victims. And that may be a bold thing for me to say, but, you know, there are a lot of people suffering in Tigray right now that I would not wish on anyone. You know, we, we've, you know, what, what the Eritrean government has done in Tigray, what the military has done, they've already done to us for decades. I already feel really terrible about that. The fact that they can do it in Tigray without any accountability is even worse. And if you're dealing with a government that denied that they were even there, gaslighting victims, how do you even see them as legitimate? I don't. Maybe you can let me know about your your opinion about that. Yeah, um, and I think going back to the existential thing, I mean, listen, uh, Misai Saforki has been in power for almost 30 years now, a little bit over 30 years now. I don't think that's able to happen without some type of support amongst some people, right? And I think he's been able to justify uh, staying in power for that long by sort of, uh, you know, dangling this uh, Wayanit boogeyman um, 
uh, to the Eritrean people who fought very hard for their independence and uh, who have, I think, rightful concerns about the TPLF. I mean, uh, as you know, um, we you talked a little bit about the border. Sovereign Eritrean territory was occupied for 20 years with a very little pushback from the international community. And I think uh, some of the actions, uh, you know, during the border war, the sort of scorched earth policy that, um, that occurred uh, against Eritrea by what was then a mainly TPLF-led government, um, I think uh, has left a, a mark amongst many Eritreans, especially the older folks who were able to remember uh, what was like back then. So, you know, there's no doubt that there are some real security issues that I think has, has, has allowed Isai Safworki to sort of justify his rule. Um, as far as sort of the toxicity, um, you know, online, the people who are dishing out sort of this, this, um, this bile really are not the ones primarily affected by the conflict. You know, these are people who are mostly in the diaspora. I mean, we had uh, the debit media, which is a, uh, the uh, Tigrayan a TPLF sort of uh, affiliated uh, me uh, media house YouTube channel based in Australia, in which a few of the guests detailed and outlined why Tigray has a right to the Red Sea, which um, is uh, really just, I think, a recipe for disaster. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of uh, Agassian rhetoric, uh, not only from Tigrayans, but also a notable Eritrean opposition, uh, Yo uh, Yosef Gebrehiwet, who uh, on his, on his uh, interview, or one of the interviews he's done on Tigray Media House, he talked about how you know, the, the leaders of the Eritrean army are usually Orthodox Christian Tigrinias, Tigrinia people, while a lot of the so foot soldiers doing a lot of these atrocities are sort of these Muslim lowlanders. And uh, again, we're seeing this sort of uh, division and, uh, and just toxic nature of, of, of this conflict and how people in the diaspora, I mean, he's based in Los Angeles and he's saying that, you know, he's not going to be affected by the the runoff from 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 the rhetoric that he's using so i think uh and you know a, a notable eritrean uh someone more famous than i i would like to admit tiffany haddish you know going on clubhouse uh talking about where's the bodies um having an argument with uh, a, a cousin of mine in which she denied the rapes and the starvation that one that is uh currently that is currently taking place in Tibet. So I think us um, as a diaspora, we should definitely contribute to a more healthy uh, online environment, knowing that this might actually help reconciliation back home, back from to our uh, respective homelands. You know, I mean, especially with uh, the Eritrean diaspora being so large, and much of the Eritrean economy uh, run on rep on uh, remittances. I think the relationship that Eritrean diaspora has to the country is even more profound, and I think more, uh, more, I guess, more connected in a way. You know, as you said, uh, that Eritreans have to pay two percent tax in the diaspora. So I think if us in the diaspora who aren't necessarily suffering directly from the conflict, I mean, our families are, but. Uh, we're in a better, we're in a much better position that they are in. I think we have a special responsibility to to tone it down and knowing that it might uh, contribute to positive uh, developments going back home. Um, and that's that's sort of my view on these on these things. Uh, but I guess I think we should turn to more um, recent developments that have occurred. Um, a lot of the fighting has shifted to the Afar region. And I think there is some solid evidence now that the Eritrean military is directly involved, not with the ENDF, not the National Defense Forces of Ethiopia, but the regional forces of Afar. A few mechanized units being sent over there. Um, how do you view this development? Um, is this sort of more proof that Isaias is just not willing to, to let up? I'll be honest. I 
regardless of whether the Eritrean military is still in Afar or they're not, it's so hard for me to discern the reality of the war and to actually identify facts that it's become so easy for them to just make up whatever they want and just run with it. Um, I, I have seen recent developments as of the recording of this uh, conversation that Eritrean mechanized divisions were within the vicinity of the fighting uh, with the Afar forces in Ethiopia. But to the extent that they're actually involved against um, the Tigrayans, uh, I think it would be safe to see more concrete evidence on, on, that, fa on that front. Um, but even if they're not there, regardless if they're there or not, it doesn't matter to me. They've, in my view, they've committed so many war crimes and crimes against humanity in Tigray that they need to be held accountable. Uh, what's happening in Afar is, again, another devastating crisis. And it just goes again into uh, the lack of accountability in, in the political culture of Eritrean uh, government. They don't have to answer to anyone. You know, they can do whatever they want almost without any consequences happening. That's really profound um, because just to give another example, just to try to answer your question, uh, the Kaluli mine that they wanted to use to extract potash uh, was done in part by getting rid of all the Afars who lived near the Donakil Depression. And there was almost no coverage of that happening until after the uh, Nevsun lawsuit came into light uh, in Canada. And a lot of uh, Eritrean Afars who brought that case, uh, I think this was in uh, British Columbia um, and at the Supreme Court in that province, they actually brought up the issue that the Eritrean government was possibly ethnically cleansing Afars in the region where they were trying to mine. And I don't know if they had a settlement, but the point is uh, there's no one really there to keep track of what's happening in the region. That's really important. Um, you might know that uh, many people reference the media as the unofficial fourth branch of government. You have the legislative, legislative, you have the judicial, you have the executive, but you also have media that keeps track of everything that's happening. Where is the media keeping track of what's happening in, in Afar? If what you said is true, that there are Eritrean military uh, units all over the area of fighting, that needs to stop immediately. Because it's not just about defeating the Tigrayans, it's also about the human cost on the Eritrean side. Has any Eritrean government supporter actually asked themselves, what is the human toll of this war for us? These are recent high school graduates and maybe young adults who are brutalized to fight in a war that they most likely do not understand the significance of it. They know what they're doing, the crimes that they're committing, but why are they doing the fighting? I don't really think anyone really knows that answer. So I, I say that uh, to make the point that the, the true intentions of, of these governments is usually kept secret until it's too late. And in order for us to reconcile with the, the truth, we have to be honest with ourselves. And we also have to admit where we're wrong. Um, if it does turn out uh, to be the case that Eritrean military is in Afar, that needs to stop, as, as I've said. Uh, and in the same instance, Tigray also needs to make sure that they're not going into other regions to possibly escalate the conflict further. I understand what they're doing. They're trying to get aid. They're trying to secure some sort of path to make sure that there is unfettered humanitarian access. But in the process, they're also killing civilians and exacerbating the conflict. You know, and it takes two to tango. It's not, you can't just put the responsibility on one only. There's, uh, there's shared responsibility. But in, in a case like this, where there's a completely foreign entity, and I'm speaking myself as an Eritrean, 
who is completely against the intervention of Eritrea in this war. When Prime Minister Abiy said himself that this was not an external issue, that really concerns me. And I would rather see the Tigrayans, the Afars, the Amharas resolve those issues on their own. They don't need us to go in to solve it for them because we already have many issues on our own. And I think wasting our security on another country's issues is undermining our sovereignty. I don't think a lot of people, even on the opposition side, understand this, that we are risking our own security for another country. What if there was a different threat that came in and we weren't prepared? That's what the National Service was there to, to do, uh, partly to rebuild the infrastructure of the country, but also to maintain a safeguard for the civilian population within Eritrea. But if we're so focused on fighting a war that seems to never end, that seems to be intractable, what happens when there's an actual threat that we just are not aware of. And I think we've been left in that position. So I would say, yes, I think the presence of Eritrean troops anywhere in Ethiopia is very disturbing. And similarly, I would say that Tigray also needs to pull its forces away from the regions that they're fighting in right now because they're not helping the situation. They're just making it worse in, in some respects. So that's, that's what I would say. And, same with Amhara, same with Afars. If they are going into Dugrai, which they had for some time, they need to leave. So, you know, it all, it all really revolves back around the so-called law enforcement operation. Of course, it's not a law enforcement operation. It's, it's a civil war. It's got completely blown out of control. And I don't think Abi Ahmed was quite as strategic as he turned out to be. I think he's been caught up in something that he has no control over anymore. Uh, I don't know how you feel uh, about the fact that these uh, developments are, are occurring without many people realizing the ramifications of it. But from your perspective, what would you say is, are, are some of the things that we need to be paying attention to in addition to the role of the Eritrean military or anything else that you would think is irrelevant or, or relevant? Um. I think we should also uh, pay attention to the shifting of alliances that we've seen in this conflict. Um, it seems like uh, over the past few months, the country has gotten, uh, country being Ethiopia, has gotten some significantly good praise. I mean, you know, there was the phone call that happened towards Biden, and then Abi decided to launch a drone strike in the debit, but he didn't receive as, as much flack as he would have maybe a year ago for that. Um, we saw the, the release of these political prisoners um, to encumber this sort of dialogue. And also uh, we've seen the filling or at least the generation of power from the Grand Renaissance Dam. Uh, so I think, I think Abi's, um, and he did go to Europe uh, in the EU uh, African Union Summit in which 90% of the leaders in the continent uh, ventured to Brussels uh, to talk about uh, integration between the two continents. And he seems to have a very good uh, rapport with most of the leaders, especially President Macron of France, in spite of the fact that the envoy of the European Union claimed just last year that he heard uh, Ethiopian officials say that they were going to destroy the civilians for 100 years to come. So I think he's sort of in a euphoria, euphoria mode right now. He's trying to get back in their good graces and possibly ending this conflict that it seems like most of the country has moved on from. Um, I know the conflict with the, uh, the Amhara region is something that if it's not handled by negotiations will end in uh, military uh, escalation and possibly military defeat for one of the sides, uh, given the uh, the dispute over the territories of Walkai Tsagere and Umera. Uh, so that, that might continue. And as I said about the shifting alliances, Abi's base now is uh, moving away from the north and sort of centering itself around the south, um, namely, you know, the parts of the Oromia region. Um, 
uh, as you know, during his tenure, there were two new states added in the country, um, the Sidama region, which was formerly part of the, the Southern Nations and Nationalities region, as well as the Southwest region, uh, which is also part of that same entity. And that seems to be where he's going to draw a lot of his support from. You know, the Northern sort of Abyssinian Orthodox Christians, we've sort of uh, uh, destroyed each other in, in his eyes. And I think he can focus now more on consolidating power in this brand new constituency that hasn't really had power in Ethiopia before. I mean, before, uh, I think the overslow of Haile Selassie during the modern period of Ethiopian history was very Shoan dominated in the historical region of Showa. Um, and with the incoming of the TPLF, it had more of a northern, uh, northern aspect to it. But as the country changes, um, certain parts of the country are changing demographically as well, including Addis Ababa. So I think that's something to keep in mind, the, the, um, the shifting of alliances and how that might end the war. But I, I'd like to know from you, George, where do you, where do you see the situation in three months or six months? Where, where are we going to be from there? No, I think it's not easy and perhaps it's risky to make predictions about this conflict because it's oscillated so many times. It goes back and forth. One minute, the Ethiopian government seems to have the upper hand and the next minute, it seems like the Tigrayan uh, defense forces uh, so-called uh, have the upper hand. And depending on who you are or where you're from or who you seem to support at the, at the given time, people's support changes as well. There is a contingency of Eritreans who wanted Tigray to go into Eritrea, which I was completely against. Now it seems like they are less supportive of that idea because it seems like the balance has shifted uh, after the introduction of drones in mass uh, to fight against the, uh, the Tigrayan fight, uh, fighters. I'm not sure if we we can make any conclusive statement about what will happen in the future, just due to the lack of uh, knowledge about what's happening right now, and we were not really able to have good foresight, and also because regardless of whatever happens, the issue will not end within a three to six month period or even within a year period. I think this needs to be a project that takes time, a lot more time than people are expecting. These are not issues that can be solved uh, within just uh, a calendar year. These are long-standing issues that are going to need a lot of time to accept that everyone has a stake in making better. And if people reject their ideas, their role in doing so, then that also has to be dealt with. Uh, in the future, I, my expectation, my hope at least, is that the fighting go, is, stops. Everyone returns back to their territory. The Ethiopian government, whatever I personally think of them, doesn't really matter at this point, finds a way to make sure that all of the relevant parties in all of the regions, have a voice in the future administration of the country because it, it seems like ethnic federalism or multinational uh, federation model is not going to really survive past uh, the tenure of Prime Minister Abiy. But at the same time, the centralization of power doesn't seem like it's going to work either because of his own base really wanting to uh, establish their own uh, base within Ethiopia. And, and if that's the case, Oromia would be much more powerful than they are right now. They're almost a third of the population. Imagine how strong they would be if they were given their own autonomy and they actually were uh, much more, uh, they were given much more uh, uh, autonomy and had, res they were respected more. On the Eritrean side, I would hope and this is not just my hope, but everyone who's in Eritrea, my hope and is that Isaiah is gone. 
hopefully by yesterday, but you know, hopefully he's, he's gone for good. The ideology dies with him. His cadres, his political henchmen go into hiding and, and are caught by people and they are forced to tell the, the truth about what's happened in Eritrea for the past 30, 31 years, even longer if you want to take, take it back to the days of the EPLF and the extermination of people through events such as the Menka, uh, Yemen. That's my hope, but is it going to happen? Time will tell. I think that's really where we're at. But I would say, in general, whatever happens, I hope it's more peaceful than it is now. I hope. If Is that going to actually be the case? I think it's a different question that I don't think we're really equipped to answer just because of the very fluid situation. Uh, and also just due to the fact that there's not a lot of international attention on what's happening in Ethiopia, whereas other conflicts in the world are receiving much more scrutiny and pressure from outside players in order to uh, stop violence, which I think is a very sad reality that uh, unfortunately countries in Africa and Asia, and even to some extent in South America, simply are not given uh, the priority of uh, of humanitarian response and coverage when it comes to their crises as uh, does in, in Europe or in Northern America. Not to downplay what's happening there, but it is to say there is some sort of uh, interest-driven uh, perspectives. Now, Asmarom, as we continue to talk about what's happening in Tigray, what's happening in Ethiopia more generally, um, there are some people who feel like the situation is hopeless, that there is no solution that could be drawn from what's happened uh, so far, and there, there is no way that we can achieve peace. First of all, are those even claims that we should take seriously? Are, are those people uh, being hyperbolic or should we take them into consideration? Are, are there really no other ways that we could find a solution to the issues that the region has been dealing with? Uh, how would you respond to some of those arguments that there aren't really uh, mechanisms that could uh, establish peace in Ethiopia and in the Horn of Africa? Um, I think uh, we need to realize the economic effect that this um, that this conflict has had and how it has strained a lot of the foreign relations that Ethiopia has with the outside world and how that is actually a leading reason why the conflict will eventually have to come to an end. I mean, Ethiopia is not by any means a wealthy country. It can't maintain, you know, uh, it can't maintain its campaign to subdue Tigray. I mean, the Tigrayan forces are still relatively well ordered and well armed. That being said, I think it's uh, I think it's important for us to realize that, you know, as as there are military stalemate, stalemates, there are also economic stalemates, and uh, I think that might contribute the most to the end of the conflict. I mean, people people are just going to be exhausted. Um, which is uh, the case of, I think, the, the Ethiopian state. I think the, the overwhelming uh, narrative and sort of disposition now is to sort of get a peace deal done, get it over with, and start rebuilding and start burying the hatchet. Um, you know, of course, we haven't seen uh, that uh, yet. You know, I think, uh, I think it's important for us to really understand that uh, it's going to come to an end somehow. And it's best that it ends sooner rather than later um, for everyone's interest. Uh, so I, I definitely see an end to the conflict. I mean, obviously, I don't want to make predictions, but, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, Abby's most recent um, address to the parliament, I think he's hinted towards that as well that he might be open towards uh, talks, which I do think they are talking behind the scenes. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, so we'll see to what extent the shuttle diplomacy between Makala and Addis and Nairobi will bring about. 
but I'm confident that this will end sooner than, than later. I'll hold my tongue though. Do you think that Isaiah Saforki, and forgive me for asking this, but it's just because of where I'm coming in from, from this. Do you think that he may sabotage that uh, dialogue process? Um, I don't think he has sort of the, the ability to. Um, if both sides are determined to have, if Addis and Makala are really determined to having peace, it will occur. Um, you have to understand that Eritrea is still a relatively small and poor country. Um, I don't think it's able to assert of itself as uh, a spoiler, as as I think a lot of people do suggest. Um, there's a reason why he uh, removed his soldiers on the eve of the um, counteroffensive or on the the federal offensive against the Tigrayan forces in June, back in June in 2021. He wanted to preserve his army. Um, you know, having an army of conscripts who are not very well motivated to fight uh, receive uh, very uh, meager stipends who aren't, who are horribly mistreated in military service I think he understands the extent to which his forces are, are able to sustain a long military campaign. Um, so I think he'll, he'll pull one of his moves and eventually abandon his alliance with the Amhara region, the reason, um, the minute it becomes uh, non-viable. And, uh, and I think he'll just retreat and go into self-preservation mode. But that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of why he got involved to begin with. I mean, the whole reason that Abi went to war was to get rid of what he felt was an incompetent and illegitimate party in Tigray. But the things that you're telling me now, it's so mystifying because we're almost 16 months into this conflict and they keep saying, not me, but uh, supporters of the government keep saying that the TPLF is dead, the TPLF is gone, but game over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a... uh, besides Sayo Mesfin and Abaye Tahaye, none of the military or political leadership of the TPLF is dead, and it doesn't seem like they're going to go away. So what was the entire purpose of fighting in the conflict? Perhaps that could be the basis to judge whether or not what happened in Tigray it was a potential genocide. And I don't think I am hyperbolic in saying that. I genuinely think if there is a legitimate investigation to uncover some of the realities of the conflict in the way that they happen, like the intentional acts against the civilian population in Tigray, that could be a case to make uh, for Isaiah to undermine the ability of Tigray to, to sustain themselves as a population. That's really hard for me to say as an Eritrean, because of course, I don't want to be associated with a government that would commit such a heinous offense. But it seems like that's the increasing reality that people have to grip with. And I think some people are in denial. I don't want to believe that's the case. But I think we really need to allow international arbitration to kind of to judge that because I don't think African institutions are really capable of doing so. Uh, I've been very disappointed in the way that the African Union has uh, handled themselves in, in the conflict that they are based in Ethiopia. They would, I, I would assume that they would take it seriously that the host nation of the African Union uh, would be treated with a higher degree of uh, care, but within their most recent meeting, uh, their main conversation topic was about recognizing uh, Israel or Palestine. I'm not sure exactly the detail, but they were talking about a situation that has almost nothing to do with Africa. And that's not to say that what's happening in Israel and Palestine is not important, but that's not relevant to what's happening in Ethiopia, in Tigray especially, but just in general, I mean, why is why is the African Union not taking African issues more seriously? Why are they continuing to lag when it comes to these crises? Are they even equipped to to move Africa along? 
I think um, the fact that you pointed out that the African Union is based in Addis Ababa is precisely why um, it was not able to respond adequately to the conflict that began in Tigray. Um, you have to understand, as uh, uh, as not only the host nation, it seems like the African Union and its predecessor organization, the Organization of African Unity, is sort of the handmaiden of Ethiopian foreign policy. Uh, as I mentioned before, Ethiopia was able to occupy sovereign Eritrean territory for 20 years, Eritrea being a country in Africa. Um, without any, I mean, I'll, I'll challenge you, can you give me a, a statement or condemnation of, of this from the African Union or the OAU? No. Um, the really violent invasion of Somalia that happened in 2006, uh, you know, that, that didn't uh, garner much um, condemnation from the African Union. Uh, even the brutal uh, war for independence uh, in Eritrea and the Ethiopian Civil War. That didn't garner much uh, attention. I mean, the Derg, the Derg, upon coming to power, was able to execute several members of the foreign ministry, and the African Union stayed silent because the new Derg regime uh, was able to use the OAU as its uh, as its enforcer. So I think for the best interest of, of the Horn is to really um, get that get that. Uh, Headquarters move somewhere else, maybe Ghana or Botswana. Um, but I, I think that's why they haven't been able to accurately uh, accurately respond to the, uh, the crisis that occurred. Um, but we'll see. Maybe the shadow diplomacy might actually bear some fruit. So that's definitely something that we're going to have to uh, uh, be on the lookout for, essentially. Is there... Um, a Sorry to interject, but is there a Switzerland of Africa that could kind of play host to these international or African-led institutions? Switzerland, I guess, is one of the hosts of the United Nations, along with New York, um, Geneva uh, in particular. Uh, you mentioned Ghana, Botswana. Is there a country that really has the capability to handle such responsibilities? A Ethiopia is the... The reason why they have the African Union is because of the so-called legacy of Pan-Africanism and being against colonialism, even though they themselves colonized Eritrea, which is an irony that people seem to ignore. Um, is there a country in Africa that could actually step up to the responsibility and take uh, the African Union away from Ethiopia? Is there a country that can even challenge them? Um, well, I think this is unfortunately going to be a permanent uh, trademark. I mean, I, I do I do have to uh, uh, add that a lot of actually African Union offices have, especially during the height of the conflict, sort of relocated from Addis Ababa um, to, to other parts, to other African capitals. And uh, given the utter decimation of the Ethiopian foreign ministry led by Abi Ahmed. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but I think something like half of the embassies and consulates around the world has been closed. If Ethiopia's institutions begin, uh, continue to sort of chip away from what they were during the EPRDF, then maybe the, um, the power that the African Union has, or at least Ethiopia's ability to manipulate the African Union uh, would probably diminish. Um, as far as good candidates, maybe Botswana, it seems like a relatively, uh, it's a relatively prosperous country. Um, only a few million people. Uh, maybe South Africa. I mean, we talked about uh, Pan-African bona fides. I think uh, being able to fight the, the f good fight against apartheid would give it uh, legitimacy. Maybe Ghana, you know, Kwame Nkrumah being a prominent Pan-African himself. Uh, but as long as it's in Addis, uh, it will be a part of Arat Kilo, regardless of where in the city the building is actually located in. Um, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's basically uh, my views on this. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's important also because the, the only real issue I think that the African Union responded to was apartheid. Um, other than that, I'm not really sure if there's been any other topic that they've handled with, with such urgency, maybe, 
Al Shabaab by sending in fighters, but I don't know if that's really been helpful, uh, especially with the interference of AFRICOM and their controversial role in Somalia. Um, I just mentioned that because it's such an important uh, country. Ethiopia. I mean, I have my own personal opinions about Ethiopia, but I can't deny they're a very important country when it comes to African geopolitics. And to see them almost skirt any kind of responsibility or blame for what's happened over the past 16 months now is really shocking to me. I think that's probably the most uh, profound takeaway that I've had from the experience of understanding what's happened in Ethiopia is that so many crimes could occur and almost nothing has come out of it. Um, the United States has really not been assertive enough in their effort to make sure that they stop. Uh, pulling out of AGOA didn't really do much, in my, in my view, just because the Americans perhaps either don't understand or don't really have much of a, a, a stake in what's happening in Ethiopia. I don't really think they care who's in charge of Ethiopia as long as they're viable partners to work with. I think the same is true for the Chinese. Uh, as long as there's someone there to work with, they, they're willing to do so. Whereas in other situations, they may want a certain government in charge so that they can manipulate the situation over there. I just don't think that it would have been so callous of Ethiopia to commit so many crimes and to allow another country to get involved in its military affairs that almost nothing has come out of it. And I think the African Union bears a significant responsibility in allowing that to occur just because they're there in Ethiopia. They literally are in Addis Ababa. And also they claim to represent the voices of Africans. But we've seen that Tigrayans, who are Africans, have not been given the amount of respect that they, that they deserve. And as you said, uh, the minister from Finland, uh, Pekka Havisto, who said, that he met with people in Addis Ababa who were very adamant about their desire to get rid of Tigray and Tigrayans. You know, that should have been on the, on the news. But unfortunately, uh, as with many other conflicts in Africa and in other parts of the world, uh, it just doesn't get the same amount of attention perhaps because we've associated violence with, with Africa or poverty with Africa when uh, it's usually something much more sinister. I mean, I think maybe this could be a good way to conclude our conversation in the sense that uh, this isn't just an isolated incident. This has happened for decades. Uh, I remember reading some uh, articles about uh, the BBC actually filming starving children in Tigray during the famine in 1984. And they were confused as to why that was the case. They thought it was just a, a natural disaster that occurred due to drought. But there were people who knew that there was a war going on. They were trying to communicate that fact. But unfortunately, even in, in today's terms, uh, nothing, there, there hasn't really been a, a, a recognition that war usually drives crises rather than simply natural disasters or unfortunate circumstances. It's usually a combination of all those things, but uh, perhaps that can be the sticking point that we, that we have to come to terms with. But having said all of this, um, Asmaram, I, I'd like to give you the final word. I think it's an interesting uh, conversation that we've been having over the past few weeks. And I, I like the fact that I, um, our conversations are evolving with the developments that occur. Um, as far as this conflict, it continues to rage on, but whenever it ends, whether it's tomorrow or in a few months from now, the effects of this conflict will be felt for generations to come. And I think that's what's important about the conversations that we're having. We can change the narrative and we can affect the effect that it will have on us and our people back home. Ask Maram, thank you.